Good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Akhil from TLR, uh, which is the German Aerospace Center. We are located uh, across many different places in Germany, but I work for the Institute for uh, Transportation Systems, uh, which is also called as TS. And we are located in Braunschweig, which is uh, central Germany. And I have a couple of my colleagues with me here. So feel free to reach later on, if not me, to them. So what am I here today for? So today's topic is uh, talking about how we at the Institute for Transparent Systems use the different Phos4G tools and softwares to create a, a tool, a platform that can handle the data management for infrastructure data. So this team includes a lot of people, the core team, and uh, the user base is quite big, but it's only as of now internal to DLR's institute. So moving on. The first thing I need to share here is what were the problems that we faced prior to introducing and developing this solution. So uh, we all know about FAIR. Uh, surprisingly, I didn't hear about FAIR much in this conference, but uh, that's a big deal. And uh, we had this uh, kind of problem that we were not able to find data related to the previous projects in our institute. And that led to, OK, we should push for this principle across the institute. And we were the, like, the uh, kind of leaders for it, my group. Uh, so what FAIR is like findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So whenever a project creates its data, it should be stored in such a way that people, even outside the project, can easily find it through different means. Uh, then it should also be accessible. Uh, and interoperable is like uh, the data generated by one project can be or there should be a possibility to use it for a different use case. And reusable is something that is relatable to interoperable where we can reuse and reproduce the data so that uh, the scientists that work on the data sets, they can uh, reproduce their results as well because it's something that is very essential in the research community when they uh, publish a journal or publications and the result has to be reproducible. So uh, also uh, we wanted some tool which can be a one-stop solution for all the data storage needs of the institute. And uh, finally, uh, we wanted something, produce something where a new joinee or the old uh, Old, uh, old doc of the institute can be able to find whatever data and the metadata they want quite easily without asking anybody concerned. So we wanted to remove this human factor from the retrieval of data. Uh, so what kind of data we deal with? In our institute, uh, which is basically a transportation institute, we work with road and railways. So my team focuses mostly on, uh, on the railway uh, infrastructure and the maintenance of the infrastructure along with the different kinds of data that can be retrieved from the railway network. So that includes something like the topology of the network and the infrastructure elements. So these are the physical elements. Like you can see in this. Okay. You can see it in the bottom corner. So these are all the infrastructure elements that one can find in the railway network, which can be switches, bridges, the, the, the rail segments, uh, the mile post, the signals. So there are many elements that one uh, can understand only when you deal with such data. Uh, on, the, on the image, you can see this is the, uh, the map of the, the Hafenbahn, which is the port of uh, Braunschweig. It's a tiny port, but uh, we have uh, units that run across this small rail network, and the these units are mounted with uh, different kinds of sensors, as seen here. So uh, what types of data we deal with? So mostly, it's the if it is not the network, then it is generally the sensor data. So every unit that we work on uh, has a load of sensors on them that calculate different things. As you can see in this point, like we have GNSS sensors, the IMU accelerometer. And in some cases, we also have some static or uh, on-mounted weather sensors. Uh, we also have visual 
uh, sensors like cameras and lidars and laser scanners. Uh, so in this particular image, you see this uh, special vehicle which has kind of like tires to uh, run across uh, on the road. And also it has some steel wheels, you can see here, through which it can actually travel on the rail. Uh, and this particular uh, feature enables it to like act as a railway wagon. And it has a ton of sensors. So my colleagues can like drive it and also observe it internally through the dashboards and the monitors there. Uh, actually, when the, when the vehicle is moving on the lines. And uh, this particular uh, data uh, that is captured across different campaigns can be uh, stored in the database or the data store that we have provided in our solution. On the right, uh, on the right side, you see uh, the same image as uh, earlier, but a different background. And this is the HDF5 format that we are pushing to use. So we have created a template for this HDF5 format through which uh, data that is acquired from different projects in different formats can be converted into one particular in-house format that will help us in streamlining and standardizing the data sets. So what we try to achieve is that whatever requirements and the problems we are facing, we will try to overcome them. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, we created this platform. So it's called as TriDAP, the Transportation Infrastructure Data Platform. And uh, what it does is like it can manage the data sets in a fair compliant way and then distribute it across the department and the institute so that the researchers can use them. Then uh, the data sets of the railway network and the uh, conditioning of that network can be stored in a way that is kind of accessible and uh, findable for the, for the scientists. And then there is a sharing of the data in a standardized way and standardized format so that it can be reusable and interoperable. The other goal that we wanted to achieve, or we have kind of achieved, is the use of the FOS4G. Now, you see all these tools. Uh, and the audience here knows everything about them. So I will not talk about them in detail, but like we use them. We have collected them in this platform so that it is quite uh, dependent on the FOS 4G tools. And of course, uh, we are a research institute that is running for a lot of years. So we had in, in place different kinds of infrastructure that was used prior to the TriDAP. So we didn't want to like create the wheel altogether again. And that's why uh, we kind of use some non-open uh, source tools like the NetApp for storage purposes. Uh, and also Grafana is like FOSS. So jumping into the architecture of the tool, so you see here the various layers through which we have achieved or tried to achieve the goals. Uh, I'll talk about each layer in detail and uh, yeah, try to explain how they serve the purposes. So starting from the data storage, uh, we have data coming from the live streams like Kafka. And also, it comes in bulks in uh, for, uh, file formats, uh, which can be structured or unstructured. For unstructured uh, data files, we generally dump them into the NetApp uh, uh, storage tool, which is kind of, uh, we call it as LDS, which I'll talk in detail later. And uh, yeah, going to the next layer is the service layer. So here is the, uh, the general tools we, we deal in our geo domain, or geoinformatics domain, which is geo server, geo network, and geo health check. We also want to have the map store uh, from geo solution society uh, in the service as well as application layer through which uh, we did not create any web application for visualizations of the geodata. So on the right side, you see, so this particular repository, this is something that is being developed by a different institute in DLR. And that institute is responsible for the research data management. So my colleagues are collaborating with them to create this uh, interface between the geo network in our institute and try to connect it with the bigger repository and catalog of data across DLR. Next is the application layer. So here we have applications from different backgrounds. They can, they are like from uh, Apache Spark and Flink, and also some custom-made Python applications. 
ranging from like four lines of code to like hundreds of lines of code. Uh, they form together the big data cluster that we have uh, assembled. And there's also there is a special weather data develop, uh, downloader that I'm personally working on. And uh, yeah, so the idea of that application is it's Python based and it will try to be a wrapper for the data that can be um, fetched from mostly the DWD, which is the German weather service uh, distributor. And they have uh, free FTPs uh, where we can fetch data, but we want to fetch it in a more understandable and readable way. So let's see how it goes. And the next layer is the monitoring layer, which mostly consists of uh, Grafara and Prometheus. Uh, so the idea is that we monitor the different services we provide through this particular infrastructure uh, platform and try to monitor them as, as good as possible so that the services are continued uh, uh, in use uh, and that no problem occurs. Next up is, I'll talk slightly bit how the infrastructure data combines uh, and is like fused with other types of data. So here you see like we try to categorize the data that we work on in four different ways. First is the, I'll give the examples of what this data in the next slide. But to talk broadly, I'll say like starting from static, which is immovable data. So that can be topography, the rail network, and so on. And then it is semi-static, quasi-static data, which is like the vegetation, some uh, things like buildings and all, which generally don't move, but there is a chance they might move, or they might be removed from the existing place. Then there is semi-dynamic, quasi-dynamic kind of data where it is like generally tends to change over the time, not so frequently, but it does. And then next is the dynamic data. So dynamic data is the trajectory data of the vehicles, pedestrians, and other movable things, which do change more often. So, uh, so multi-layer map is something we used to call earlier as LDM, which is again a confusing term. Uh, so we all know what LDM is, but we, we tried that it should not mix with the core concept, so we are calling it as multi-layer map now. And it can like be uh, act as a data hub and uh, database for the georeference data. And uh, there is a high possibility we can create web applications by fusing this kind of data, which we had done in one of the applications or one of the projects uh, in our institute. Then uh, the, uh, the, the interface between these kinds of data can be standardized uh, through, of course, OGC and some other standards that are very well known in our domain. And uh, there is a provision for pushing the data, sharing the data through API, and also, as I said, web apps. So the examples, as I mentioned earlier, are given here. So uh, there is some mixing of like German and English some places, so yeah. But uh, that's what I meant, uh, what these type of data are. Now, uh, this is a quick glance. Uh, I'll not go into detail of the collaboration diagram that we have established because in, the, in this platform, we tend to work with many groups and many teams. And it is not possible for a small core team of four to five people to manage everything. So this is something that we came up quite late in our uh, uh, development phase where we wanted to establish a standard procedure to incorporate the new projects along with the new geodata and how and where it can be stored and accessed and used and reused so and also like published so what kind of things do you need to do across the platform so starting when you get the actual new data set uh, we have to decide if it is structured unstructured if it can be stored in database or not uh, then uh, how it can be retrieved uh, what can be the other aspects of data management, like the archival of data, the, uh, the duplication or the backup. So the one important thing is that across this platform, we try to not have duplicates of data because some data sets can extend to up to terabytes in size. And uh, that's not sensible to copy the same data set again in some other way. So uh, for database, uh, and the data storage uh, aspect, 
of the triad app, we have the TDP instance. TDP is the transport data platform. Uh, it's an old concept, but we are trying to renew it by extending it to different types of standards. Uh, mainly, it is the Rail ML, uh, the version 2.5, where uh, it's an extensive vocabulary of railway domain concepts. And we try to adhere to this kind of uh, standard so that it can be understandable and reusable across the railway community. Then, of course, we have the OSM importers uh, to fetch the data about the railway networks. Then also Inspire is something that is quite widely used or is pushed for in the EU. And we also have our colleagues working for creating an importer for Inspire. And of course, Python. Then the, uh, the so TDP is a database, and therefore it can work with the structured data. But uh, for unstructured data, we have the LDS, which is based uh, on the, uh, the NetStore app I mentioned earlier. So you can manually or programmatically copy data to this kind of storage space. For retrieving data, uh, as TDP is linked with uh, GeoServer layers, and the data from GeoServer layer uh, can be stored to database. So uh, we all know how that functions. So I'll not go into details of that. And then the direct database access, of course, where you can just query and try to fetch the data. For LDS, it, as it is file format data, you can export them by creating different kinds of services, or just go to that particular storage and manually retrieve them. Yeah, so uh, here is, a, is the same diagram again. I'll just focus on what you can see here. So the pink color, uh, the curves is the railway network, and the small dots are the railway crossings that you can see in this particular map. And then there is a bridge, which I think is hard to recognize, but it's some, yeah, it's here. So just uh, highlight that we can see different kinds of data. So this is a part of the Ban server map viewer, which was, or which is currently used extensively in our institute, but we kind of want to change it to the map store. So another um, FOSS 4G tool. So this is a quick look of what TDP looks like. It has a lot of things. Uh, so my colleague here uh, has kind of spent lots of days creating it, uh, rechecking with the real ML format and all those things. So yeah. Next is another example or screenshot of uh, GeoNetwork. We all know GeoNetwork can be a good catalog, but also we are trying to use it extensively for storage of the metadata because uh, we also are a part of the HMC, which is the Helmholtz uh, Metadata Collaboration. It's a big thing for metadata in Germany. And uh, we are kind of active in that consortium. So uh, in a net, uh, geo network, we can store a lot of metadata, uh, including the contact person, the, all the provenance information of a data set, and how or like there are too much metadata that uh, we can explore. This is something uh, which we used to do more often earlier, is to use QGIS. But uh, yeah, so uh, here you can see the same network of railways, but with all the attributes of the infrastructure elements in this particular map. So all these are the infrastructure details uh, that one needs for the maintenance and uh, predictive maintenance of the infrastructure. This is just a screenshot of the Prometheus uh, that uh, dashboard that we have developed for monitoring of the geo server. Uh, so here you can see it's a, it's a good tool to have along with geo server if your geo server if you have hundreds of geo server layers and they are being extensively used by a lot of uh, not just human users but also by different tools and services. So uh, we try to we try to overview them through this particular dashboard and see whatever layers, uh, layers are in uh, frequently used or which layers are out of use so that we can kind of remove it from the GeoServer instance and make up some space whenever possible. Yeah, so as, as, as uh, I'm running out of time, I'll just quickly tell you. So this is the uh, fairness matrix. Uh, you must be thinking I'm talking too much of fair, but yeah, it is kind of a big deal. So. Uh, so we know the principles of fair, so we have certain aspects that we have already covered, like uh, finding the data set through metadata, controlled access, uh, then 
uh, interoperability through the converters, import exporters. Then we have the reusability through the community standards and open file formats. And there are many things that we have planned. So, uh, and many of the things we have actually started uh, just a few months uh, from this year. Yeah, so rounding it up, uh, what we have seen today is that FOS4G is huge, but also there are things that can be sufficient for your needs if you try to go through in them in detail. Um, and then metadata is quite important because metadata actually is uh, the core of the data set. So yeah, try to uh, have as much metadata as possible to enrich your data. Then, uh, yeah, my colleague has already given a talk in two days before about the monitoring plugin for GeoServer. Uh, so you can check that out. And what we want to do later is like try to, or we are already having the rural infrastructure uh, data in our platform so that we can have one single stop for road and rail data. And we also want to have the cloud native stack along with the existing setup that we have so that it becomes more modern as we have seen in the, uh, in the presentation yesterday. So, uh, so this is part of the DLR's uh, Digital Atlas 2.0 project. It's a big project and a cross domain project from different institutes of DLR. And we are a part of it that way. So yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ikil. So we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, you're still processing the <laughs> the social is, bites. <laughs> yeah, this is quite a application-oriented use case. So yeah, I will ask everyone to like go for it. Try to have something in your institute as well. No one? Ah. So uh, you're interested in the whole infrastructure. This looks amazing. And if it contains all the data, like about the railways, that's perfect. Uh, if there's some other projects going on, they might be interested in it. So my question here would be, and it offers, since we have GeoServer there running, can it be accessible via a, as a stack catalog to get to, uh, some of the data? Because uh, I didn't understand clearly, but uh, this is kind of like a still an internal uh, thing. So we are not, we have, because we work for a like government funded institute, we cannot like give our data openly to outside players. So that's a kind of a obstacle, but yeah. Oh. oh, right. So the data is not open. No. Yeah. <laughs> the tools are, but not the data. Will it be open maybe eventually? No. no. Like, I would say, I, I personally think it's a hard no, because it, all the data is governed with the SLAs and contractual agreements with maybe uh, if somebody has a noble heart, like people in Deutsche Bahn or somewhere, they can otherwise, yeah. So yeah, as he said, a lot of uh, data sets are like, Within, collected within certain projects and can be shared only with the project partners, but there are some subsets which uh, will be made in the future. Um, I mean, it they'll be made open source in the future. The geo servers that we are using are openly accessible, and yeah, maybe in the future some data sets will be accessible, but not all of them. But yeah, they can be reused maybe for when projects the, in the future. Yeah, when, when the project where DLR is involved, but yeah. <laughs> when the project partner uh, forget about their project, we can <laughs> share it. Yeah, it would be very really nice to have it as an extension or an alternative to OpenStreetMap since it really looks well cura curated. Yeah, we are also kind of working on like the ac getting accurate or changing the improving the accuracy of the data that we fetch from OSM, especially for the relevant network. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for this intense presentation. Thanks. We got uh, we learned a lot and. Uh, this is the end of the first uh, presentation of this blog.